Welcome everyone. This is Mary Duskwood, Director of Operations and Research here at Birchworks. Today, two of our senior data science and analytics recruiters will be answering your career questions on skills, interview criteria, hiring trends, and more. For those of you who aren't familiar with Birchworks, we are an executive recruiting firm specializing in quantitative fields like analytics, data science, and marketing research. Over the past several years, Birchworks Market Insights have been repeatedly mentioned in the press, including The Economist, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and The Chicago Tribune, among many others. Birchworks has also been repeatedly recognized by Forbes as one of America's best recruiting firms. And now for a quick introduction of our speakers today. As a senior executive recruiter at Birchworks, Sandy Marmot has more than 13 years experience in analytics recruiting and is Birchworks go-to recruiter for mid to senior level candidates in analytics and data science. As one of the first members of Birchworks, Sandy has always been adept at nurturing relationships and has worked with a number of job candidates that have now become Birchworks clients. As one of Birchworks senior quantitative recruiters, Heidi Kalish has over 20 years experience recruiting in the data science and analytics fields. She also has significant expertise with quantitative roles within the financial services space, including credit risk, fraud analytics, and more. Her depth of experience and extensive knowledge also allow her to share keen career and hiring insights. Both Sandy and Heidi have been actively involved in the analytics community, participating in groups like the American Statistical Association and INFORMS for years and contributing their career insights to the Birchworks blog. And now before we dive into the Q&A portion, we wanted to share just a few pieces of data with you. Uh, you know, Birchworks, we're always working on our research uh, to give you the latest market insights. Uh, we received a lot of questions about salaries, uh, as usual, from the registration page. So we wanted to give an overview of how salaries vary in data science and analytics, depending on your job level. This is from our 2020 data science and analytics salary study, where we segment salaries into six categories, IC standing for individual contributor and MG standing for manager. These levels are broken down by years experience for the ICs and management responsibilities for the managers. Salaries can vary widely by region, educational background, and more. So for more information, I highly recommend downloading our most recent salary report, which is available for free at birchworks.com study. And it's got a lot in there. It's like 50 pages. Um, there's a lot of data including quartiles, means, medians, uh, and should hopefully give you an idea of what salary range you might expect for your specific situation. The report has more data than we could hope to share with you today, and so hopefully it will be able to answer all of those salary questions, and we'll get on uh, soon to the career questions. Um, a lot of people will also asking about work from home. Uh, you know, that's the topic du jour right now. Uh, and earlier this year, we surveyed data science and analytics professionals on whether they prefer to office or work from home. And 72% said that they prefer work from home. We also broke down those responses by level. So who is the most enthusiastic to return to the office? Interestingly, we found that the group who had the highest number of professionals wanting to be in the office, 40%, was at the IC1, the Early Career Individual Contributors. This enthusiasm for office life could be a result of the social cohesion and perks that appeal to younger professionals, seeing their work friends, free food, happy hours, etc. Those at the MG2 level, which is usually director, senior director level um, professionals, were another group that were more likely to favor being in the office at 36%. In contrast, when we look at early level managers, MG1s, this is the group who are the least likely to want to be in the office, only 10%. This may be the result of family life stage that someone may be at at this stage of their career, so they may favor more time at home and more flexibility. We also know from our previous survey on work from home that the appeal of flexible work from home options can increase greatly during someone, depending on someone's years of work experience which can be somewhat related to things like uh, family life stage. 
When we asked if a hybrid model were offered, what do you think the optimal number of days in the office would be? The highest portion, 31%, said two days, followed by three days at 26%. Only 3% selected in the office five days per week, and only 5% said four days per week. Overall, more than 90% of professionals we asked said they'd prefer three days or fewer in the office. The average was right around two days, so it will be interesting to see what the reality will be as more companies return to office life and whether more of them take advantage of flexible schedules and partial work from home options. And for those of you who are curious about the state of the data science and analytics hiring market in 2021, a few weeks ago, we surveyed hiring authorities to ask about their hiring plans for Q1 and Q2 of this year. According to our respondents, which represented over 150 companies across the US, we found that 73% of data science and analytics teams are planning to hire during the first half of 2021. This is actually a significant increase from last year, where 67% of teams had hired, planned to hire in the first half of 2020. There is a possibility that some of this hiring increase might still be attributed to filling empty roles after COVID-19 cutbacks. But for many of our conversations with analytics teams, many organizations had already resumed their hiring sometime last year. And you can read more about the work from home and hiring surveys, as well as our other hiring market insights and research over at birchworks.com slash blog. And now on to our regularly scheduled programming, the Q&A. We've gathered lots of really great questions from you on the registration page, but please feel free to continue sending additional questions using the chat function on your screen. All right, our first questions have to do with data science jobs and skills. Um, so up first, does a data science career have an emphasis on business sense or is it mostly technical? Sandy, I know you've talked a lot about this, so I'm gonna hand it over to you. Oh, okay. Thanks, Mary, and thank you for that great introduction. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, okay, in regards to your question, uh, in the past, technical was primary, but now there is a very big demand for coupling that with consultative skills. So yes, business sense is very important. And I think this is because, or I, or I know I should say, it's due to analytics being such a core structure of the business. So there's lots of work with internal teams and helping to solve their business problems. So the organization needs that technical as well as the consultative. So that's my answer. All right, thank you very much, Sandy. Um, next question, what kind of jobs are there for data science and analytics professionals in the finance industry, like banks, private equity, asset management, research, et cetera? Uh, Heidi, this is clearly right up your alley. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Uh, yes, there's definitely a lot of opportunities in finance for analytics and data science professionals. Um, you know, in private equity firms, uh, Sandy and I actually placed a candidate last year that was an analyst um, supporting their internal investment team, kind of helping them um, drive, you know, the, the areas that they were going to invest in. Um, we've also placed uh, a lead or a head of data science um, for a private equity firm. And it was interesting because this was more of a centralized data science team that they were developing that would act as internal consultants for the various holding companies. Um, in terms of banks and uh, fintechs, you know, you're going to see a lot of credit risk analytics. Um, more traditional probably credit risk analytics with the, the bigger banks and then the fintechs um, a lot of times are using some non-traditional data to develop the credit scores. So um, definitely see a lot of those types of roles. And we also see marketing analytics, um, you know, for example, who should we target for this credit card offer and how should we target them? Um, which channel should we be using? You know, analytics around all of, of those different business questions. Um, and then also looking at customer sentiment analysis using, you know, NLP, um, doing some voice of the customer type of analytics. Um, and then in terms of investment firms or hedge funds, we've uh, seen data scientist positions that are 
focused on developing the actual algorithms that's going to drive their investment strategy. So definitely lots of opportunity there within finance. Wow, that is, um, yeah, there seems to be some really great stuff going on there. Um, our next question is um, something we get asked all the time. Um, is coding a necessary part of the data anal analysis, data science career? And if so, what language is most frequently used? Yeah, I can take that one. Good question. Um, you know, and obviously kind of the level of technical uh, depends on the role. Uh, data scientists, um, you know, more technical than maybe a data analytics professional, but for the most part, um, I would say the majority of our analytics and data science roles are wanting hands-on experience in R or Python. Um, you know, in the past it was SAS, but now definitely more R or Python with Python actually edging out R um, in recent years. Yeah, absolutely. I know that we um, run our SAS versus R versus Python survey every year and uh, Python has been gaining ground consistently mm -hmm. uh, as the favored tool of data yeah. scientists and analytics professionals. Um, next question, what are the most in-demand skills and what are the top skill requirements that recruiters look for? Um, Sandy, I'm going to hand this one to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but uh, as I mentioned before, uh, <laughs> analytic folks are doing more collaborating and consulting. So aside from that technical, which obviously everybody needs to know for these roles, they need to be able to present their ideas and their insights from the data to the business stakeholders and leaders. So again, that business acumen, business sense, collaboration is very uh, in demand right now. I'm hearing that from a lot of our clients. So I would go with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then what is the usual difference in salary and career for a bachelor's versus a master's degree in data science? Um, Sandy, I, I know you have uh, a lot of thoughts here. Okay. Well, actually, Mary, uh, this is a hard question uh, because most of our clients require an advanced degree, such as master's or PhD. Um, but I can say degrees affect salaries more on that junior level, um, individual contributor candidates more than the seniors that are further along in their career. So um, to your beginning point about our salary study, I would direct folks to look at that portion as to how degrees can impact salary. It's all in there, detailed. Uh, but uh, that is pretty much what I have to say for that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We have a whole <laughs> section in the salary study, so that's a great place to look. Um, our next round of questions uh, are centered around uh, interviews and the job search process, uh, which is a very important thing um, for everyone to know about. <laughs> um, so how do you best represent yourself to help stand out um, for the recruitment team? Heidi, your turn. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I would say to do your homework. Um, don't just go to the company website. Obviously, that's you know a good place to start. But look for uh, the company mentioned elsewhere, either online in the news, um, and then also make sure to look up the backgrounds of the people you're interviewing with and get familiar with them um, as individuals, and have some thoughtful questions prepared for them. You know, maybe think a bit out of the box. Um, obviously, there's a, kind of the standard questions that we typically might ask uh, at an interview, but you know, put some thought into those questions and have those prepared. Um, and then lastly, I, I wanna mention, don't forget to send out thank yous. You know, I know um, in this digital age, things um, have changed a bit, but definitely you know, after a final interview or what would be the on-site stage, um, send out some thank you emails and make those really kind of personalized and targeted, you know, to each individual, not just a blanket, um, you know, format thank you letter to to all of the people you met with. I think those are are good ways to kind of help stand out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 
What are some entry-level data science and analytics titles you recommend for recent college graduates to apply for? Uh, Sandy. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I wouldn't be doing my job if I wouldn't go back and talk about what Heidi just said. In terms of asking questions, uh, don't ask about benefits and salary in your first interview. You want to just be asking about the business more so. Just gives you a better flavor as a candidate, not to be all about the benefits. So I just had to add that. Okay. Uh, okay. So <laughs> to your question, uh, what would you look for in titles um, for the juniors? That would be data analyst, statistical analyst. Sometimes they call this an associate, junior data scientist, and uh, try to focus on roles that are requiring less than three years of experience. Those are going to be those more uh, startup junior roles. Excellent advice. I, I know we we also made sure to discuss this with uh, Katie Ferguson here at Birchworks, who um, mm -hmm. I'm sure if you're a, a recent grad, you've you've probably talked to her. Um, she she really uh, knows that part of the the market really well. Um, and then for selection criteria for candidates, what what is some typical selection criteria that you see? Um, I know that you were talking about this the other day, Sandy. Oh, okay. Um, well, again, here I am with the solving business problems. Uh, using analytics is so key to so many of these roles. So analysis and insights generation seems to be the core skill set for anyone in analytics and being able to present those ideas to management and also be able to pull out the questions from stakeholders. Um, and this is why in the interview process, the case study is such a big part of the interview process now because that gives the interviewers a chance to see how the candidates work in these areas. So definitely that presentation, business problem, insights are very key indicators aside from the technical. Excellent. Um, what types of questions um, are top of mind for a senior level data analytics hiring manager and how should one prep for those questions? Good question. Um, I can take that one. Um, Thank you. I would, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Definitely um, be prepared to talk in detail about a project that you've worked on and try to find one that, you know, either you're really proud of um, or is particularly relevant to the role that you're interviewing for. Um, and I always recommend to not just show the work that you've done or the type of modeling or the type of analyst analysis um, but be able to show the impact that that made um, so not just what you were doing on a daily basis but how it drove the business or impacted the company um, and then in terms of you know interviewing for a management position they'll likely ask about your leadership style uh, maybe give you a situational question and ask how you would handle it so definitely be prepared you know to talk about that as well all right, excellent. Um, and then we have a question um, asking about LinkedIn profiles and resumes and how to make sure those are um, really, uh, those look good for someone looking for a leadership role or really any role in analytics or data science. Um, Heidi, I know you've talked a lot about this sort of thing. Yeah, no, that's a great question actually. Um, Make sure your resume and profile are both up to date and definitely make sure oh. that they are matching. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a resume or a LinkedIn profile and you know the current position isn't listed on one or the other. So it can be you know a little you know messy or confusing um, if they're not matching. Yeah. So definitely make sure that they're matching. Um, and again, highlight the impact that your work has made. Um, 
So not just kind of listing the tools or the types of modeling and analytics that you've done, but you know, how did that impact the business? It might be um, more common as you get more senior um, in your career, but yeah, definitely make sure that they're up to date, matching, and uh, if you can highlight any sort of impact that you can um, show your work has had. That's a good point, Heidi, in terms of the matching, because there's been times where the resume has an extra company or vice versa. So yeah. when they don't match, the hiring managers get a little bit nervous that there's a red flag there. And even if there's no indication of any red flags, it, you just, matching works. That, we'll go yes. with that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and then kind of linking back to our, our first question in this section, um, how do you answer, why do you want to work for us? Um, Heidi, is this, I think, similar to uh, what you've already uh, answered previously? Yeah, it definitely ties back a little bit to that first question. Um, again, do your homework on the company, really understand the work that they're doing. Um, I think that helps show your interest in the company, um, talk about why it interests you. Um, you can also talk about why you feel it would be a good fit for you and your long-term career goals. Um, so just really, you know, make sure you have a good understanding of the company and the work they're doing and, and how that kind of ties back to your interests and your, uh, your career goals. All right, great. Um, and then how do you approach a recruiter about opportunities? Uh, Sandy, I'll let you have this one. Okay. Well, keep in mind, there are internal recruiters. So those are the ones that work specifically for the company. They're full-time employees of that company. So they're going to be talking to you about only their company positions, possibly only one position. Um, and then there's recruiters in a recruiting agency, such as Birchworks. Uh, so Birchworks or other recruiting agencies uh, can present multiple opportunities to you. So it's a different kind of conversation talking to a recruiting recruiter uh, or an internal. Uh, important to us as uh, working with you because we might have a few roles to talk to you about. So it's important to be transparent about do you have other interviews going on? Are you getting close to a final offer? You know, this way we can let our clients know if there's a timing issue or, you know, you have one more week before you have to make a decision on an offer. So it's very important to be transparent with us. It makes the guessing game um, go away, which is great. I find that the candidates I work with that are very transparent, things seem to go a lot smoother than me trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. So I guess this is an advertisement for how to work with a recruiter. Um, so, you know, also it's, it's very important, this has happened to us, so I, I feel like I should mention it, um, that after a recruiter tells you about an opportunity and says they're gonna present your profile, a lot of people, just because they don't know how things work, might get off the phone and then apply to the company directly to, after they tell, you know, after we tell them about it. And that really kind of, um, for a better term, messes up uh, <laughs> everything that yes. we're trying to do because it just makes things complicated. So I would just let you know not to do that. Yeah, and, and I'll chime in on that too, if you don't <laughs> mind. Um, the pain it, point. <laughs> yeah, right. Whether it's the same role or a different role um, within the within that company. Once you've applied directly um, to a company, we typically can't resubmit you. So then that kind of ties our hands and, and we're not able to really assist you um, for opportunities with that organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Let us be your advocate. Yes. Um, all right. Our next set of questions is around career advice and career advancement. Um, what skills do you need to make the transition from being an individual contributor into a management role? 
Danny, take I'll let you one. have this one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, ta I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, okay, that's a great question because a lot of times uh, folks that don't have direct reports want to get into a role that has direct reports. And the client wants to see kind of a transition period or, or in order to let them go without having current direct reports. So it's good to bring up um, if there's been mentoring of others or managing vendors or managing projects, because all of these have management skill sets, but you're not quite there in terms of having the official direct reports. But if you can talk about these skill sets, that can help you get into a management role in some instances. All right, uh, excellent. Yeah, I know that's a um, transition. Um, a lot of people are always curious mm -hmm. on how best to make. Um, right. And then at a mid-level or management role, and how can you transition from more of an analytics role to a data science role? Well, I would say, you know, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind if you're looking at making changes mid-career um, and you're trying to, you know, go from one area to a, a different area is you might have to take a step back. So just, you know, be prepared for that. Um, if you're coming from, you know, more of a, an analytics focused background and you don't have a lot of that specific data science um, experience or knowledge, then, you know, you might have to kind of take a step back, get that experience and, you know, then continue on down that path. Yeah, and taking that step back also, you're, you're going to lose that management piece most likely uh, because you're learning a whole new skill set. So you're not going to be managing to start off, but uh, it is worth moving if that's what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and how do you know when you should be changing positions or companies? Uh, Sandy. Oh, okay. Um, well, first of all, this is very technical. Listen to your gut. <laughs> Are you unsettled? Is something making you feel like you should be there? I, I really believe in the gut in terms of telling you what's going on. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, you can ask yourself or look around and see, is top management supporting analytics? That's really important in analytics, that you want senior leaders to really support the endeavor of utilizing analytics. Uh, and that's important for analytic folks in terms of opportunities and moving forward, or are they starting to outsource the analytics? That's always a, a red flag. Um, are you still learning? Do you have mentors? Uh, and you know, have you become complacent? Are you no longer excited about what you do? Have you lost your passion, your fire in the belly? Those are all signs which tell you that maybe it's time to start looking. All right, thank you, Sandy. Um, statistical software options. Um, so this is, uh, again, a really popular question. The options are always expanding and how do you stay current? Um, Heidi, I'll let you tackle this. Sure, um, yeah, I mean, it definitely is kind of an ever evolving um, area within analytics and data science when it comes to tools and and what you're using. So I think online courses, you know, like Coursera or doing boot camps, those are great ways to beef up your skills or add a new skill. Um, and then to stay up to date on the industry as a whole, I recommend either joining a local analytics group in your community or online. Um, and then another thing you can do that's pretty simple is, you know, when you are looking at job descriptions, be aware of the tools they're mentioning. Um, you know, see what seems to be trending um, when it comes to those positions. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, all right. Our next section, we're going to be talking about analytics hiring and market trends. Um, so again, work from home is a huge topic right now and what's going to be happening in the future as far as remote work. 
Um, do you know what percent of people are going back to the office by this summer? And how are the opportunities looking for permanent remote data scientist roles? Uh, Sandy, I know you've looked into this. Oh boy. I left my crystal ball in the other room. Um, okay, <laughs> it's hard to predict this thing. I don't know percentages, uh, but I would say the last two weeks, I'm starting to hear <clears throat> uh, July as a date to go back to some uh, offices full time, uh, either or go back, have the folks that were waiting to relocate be there by July 1st. Uh, I don't know if that means being in the office five days a week, it's probably going to be a hybrid is my guess, two to three days a week to start with. I think all rushing back in the office five days a week is going to be scary for most. Um, so the next few months will probably be telling. I mean, obviously, we have to look at the numbers and what's happening. Uh, but this is a common theme that I've been listening to lately. July is popping up. And I remember in the early part of the pandemic, people would talk about going back to the office January of 2021. And we were also shocked that they were pushing it out that far. And here we are in April. But um, July, let's all look to July. Um, oh, okay. So the second part of your question. Um, for How are opportunities roles. for permanent remote data scientist roles? Got it. Okay. So I'm also hearing more clients are bringing up um, that jobs can be remote, which is very exciting for some that don't want to relocate or don't want to go back to an office. Uh, but there are certain limitations on the states you can be in. And this is because uh, a lot of the corporations have to be registered for tax purposes in certain states. So there are certain states that are more friendly to that. Uh, so this is the new thing that's going on now is that I'm waiting for my clients to give me those states that have been approved for people to work remote. So it's remote with a little bit of a uh, caveat there. Oh yeah, that's a really interesting point. It'll be, um, we'll have to see how that all shakes out as time goes on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. We have had a few additional questions come in from the chat. So I wanted to cover a few of those um, before we wrap up here. Um, one goes back to talking about resumes and LinkedIn. Um, we were asked, what kind of information should you put um, in your resume versus your ring LinkedIn or vice versa? Like, should there be different information in one or the other? Um, I can add to that. Uh, I'm starting to, I've had a clients actually ask me for their LinkedIn profile. So they're kind of being used as resumes also. I mean, obviously you always want that resume, but I think the LinkedIn should be pretty thorough in terms of, um, you know, what your skills have been. And I know that a lot of folks, when they're doing sourcing, will look to see what you have on your LinkedIn profile. So I think uh, being more detailed would be important in terms of going through some of the skills you have on your LinkedIn profile. I agree. Yeah, I think, you know, more information, the better. All right. And then um, we have a, a question about GitHub. And is it important to have a GitHub account along with a resume? Um, and this this particular question is specific to financial services roles, but um, across the board, other industries as well. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I I don't know that it necessarily is a requirement. Obviously, it's probably not going to hurt you <laughs> if you have a GitHub. Um, but I haven't seen that be, um, you know, something that our clients are are necessarily looking to or looking for as of yet. Obviously, that can change. But um, yeah, so you know, it's great if you do have it. I don't think it's going to be a detriment necessarily if you don't. All right, great. Um, and then do you have any advice um, around 
switching industries. We have a, a couple of people who are, are looking to switch industries um, within analytics. So, you know, going from, say, financial services to healthcare or um, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, okay. So that's a, that's a really good question. And I think switching industries in the early part of your career is a little bit easier than if you've had 15 years of experience or something in a certain industry. So I definitely think that the skills are transferable in terms of the data analytics and, and those skills. But um, and you can always train somebody on industries. Uh, you can't always train them on obviously becoming a data scientist. So yes, switching industries early on is definitely easier, but uh, lots of clients now because of the inventory of candidates are becoming more open to industry experience. So meaning that a healthcare company doesn't require healthcare. All right, that's great to hear. Um, I think the, the last question we're gonna do here, um, uh, again, it's about work from home, but it's about, are there any special skills that um, recruiters or hiring managers want to see um, for a virtual role? Like, is there anything specific they're looking for in a virtual employee versus someone who's going to be in the office? Um, I can take that one. I Obviously, it's kind of still a newer and emerging space. Um, I don't know that we've seen a difference um, in terms of the you know, just the, the job descriptions uh, for the remote opportunities or the targeted skill set, I would imagine they definitely need somebody who's organized, um, who knows kind of how to prioritize their work, uh, since there's not going to be somebody, you know, right there with them, who's comfortable reaching out when needed. Um, you know, they might not as intuitively, you know, kind of turn to their coworker, or they, well, they can't turn to their coworker at the next <laughs> desk and say, you know, what do you think about this? Or can I, can I ask you about this? So being comfortable, you know, reaching out in a situation like that, um, you know, so, and I think we'll yeah. you know, maybe see more of a um, specific skill set that our remote roles are looking for. Um, but as of now, I just think, you know, definitely being comfortable, um, organizing your work, prioritizing your work, and kind of knowing what to stay on top of is is pretty key for a remote position. Yes, and also to that point, sharing your screen happens a lot more. So be careful <laughs> what you have going on in the background. So that's, yeah, that's uh, a good this, point. there's been some great stories about that, but uh, <laughs> that's definitely a skill set for virtual sharing that screen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that's uh, being really comfortable with the technology is probably helpful too. Of course, for analytics and data science professionals, I'm sure that's not nearly as much of a problem. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Sandy and Heidi, for sharing all of your expertise today. Uh, and if you're looking for additional information on the topics we've just covered, uh, I have a few announcements that you might be interested in. If you want to know more about our salary data, our full report breaks down salaries by quartiles, salary means, and medians. And we examine salaries by demographic factors like industry, gender, region, education, and much more. And this year, um, we had an uh, analysis on COVID-19 impacts on the analytics community, as well as developing hiring trends. So that 2020 report is just full of some great information and you can download it for free at birchworks.com slash study. And if you're looking to add to your data science and analytics staff, we'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming. We offer contingency, retained and contract staffing services all the way from entry-level analysts up to chief analytics officer searches. So you can send an email to info at birchworks.com and we'd love to tell you more. And for more hiring our market insights, you can check out our blog, birchworks.com slash blog, where you can find flash surveys on SAS versus R versus Python preferences, work from home, career guides specific to data scientists and analytics professionals, and a lot of other great information. And you can also follow us uh, across our social media channels, stay up to date on our latest research. 
And on our YouTube page, you can find recordings of our other presentations, including our data science and analytics salary webinar, um, our SAS versus R versus Python flash survey analysis, hiring market predictions, career planning videos, and a whole lot more. Uh, if you'd like to discuss hiring plans or see if we have roles that are a fit for your experience, you can email info at birchworks.com to get started. And again, thank you everyone for joining us and for all of the wonderful questions you submitted. And thank you to Sandy and Heidi for giving us their time this morning. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day.